Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we are going to break down the Thursday night slate of DFS for college football week one. 2023. That's right. College football is all the way back and I could not be more excited. And so we are going to break down the DFS slate on DraftKings and FanDuel for Thursday, August 31st, 2023. We are going to break down all the games on each slate. We are going to highlight our best plays at the quarterback, running back, and wide receiver position and hopefully do it in an entertaining and informative way that can help you guys win big with your DFS lineups, whether it be on DraftKings or FanDuel this Thursday night. College football is back, y'all, and, and I'm just I'm really excited about it. I, I cannot wait. Hopefully, I'm going to be able to preview the Saturday slate with you guys, but just know if I do not come out with a Saturday episode, there's a good reason for it. My wife is currently very pregnant, and so um, there is a chance that our baby is born in between now and the Saturday slate, and I got to be honest, I'm kind of going to prioritize that over uh, a college football DFS preview. So I will be back if I do miss that episode. In due time, I promise. So if you like what you see on this episode, if you're new to College Football DFS, subscribe to the channel. We are going to have weekly episodes previewing each College Football DFS slate. And College Football DFS is one of my favorite things, y'all. It is one of the DFS games that I feel like I'm personally the best at, college football as well as college basketball, because there's not as much sharp money in playing DFS college football and college basketball. There's not a whole lot of people using optimizers. There's not a whole lot of people that have the depth charts memorized of every team in the FBS and on slates like this, the FCS. So you can have an advantage by just doing a little bit of research and and by knowing who's playing and and what to expect from each player. And hopefully the research that I've put together and I'm sharing with you guys here in this episode can help you guys win in week one. Now, if you did play on week zero, I do wanna talk about a few things for that. First off, if you watched our week zero preview, there were a few things that we were absolutely right on. We were right about Pafeli Ashlock, the Hawaii wide receiver. We were right about uh, Caleb Williams being a guy that you absolutely had to have in your lineups. Um, but And we were right about Smoke Harris of Louisiana Tech. Don't forget about him either. But week zero was kind of marred by some unexpected situations happening. You know, you had Diego Pavia, New Mexico State, getting benched in the middle of the game. You had Curtis Rourke of Ohio getting, you know, hurt in the middle of the game. You had um, Jacoby Jones of Ohio being a scratch that was late. You had multiple guys that were actually scratched from the games, you know, like after, you know, kickoff of the DFS slate. So a lot of interesting happenings in week zero. And unfortunately, a lot of that's kind of regular in college football. College football, the FS is kind of where a lot of chaos happens. So I will say for injuries, if you are looking to have the most up-to-date information on injuries, I recommend doing a quick Twitter search, or I guess X search now you could call it, of all your players' names 30 minutes before kickoff. College football teams are generally done with their warmups by then. And hopefully there's been some beat writer or some fan or somebody that has tweeted about this player is not in uniform or this player is not on the sidelines or whatever. You know, there's usually somebody tweeting about a guy before game time. But it, it does kind of stink that, you know, DFS sites like DraftKings and FanDuel don't get those live updates until after the game kicks off. And it does stink that for a lot of these lesser known teams, these group of five teams and FCS teams, that coverage is really hard to find. When we get later on in the season, and it is mostly Power 5 teams, most of those teams do have a beat writer that is dedicated and will have information before, like 30 minutes before lock, um, if a guy is out for the game. But hey, it's college football DFS. If you're worried about injuries, that is my recommendation, is to do a quick Twitter search, or I guess X search, before the game does kick off. Now, also, when it comes to college football DFS, it's a little bit different from a lot of other DFS games. Ownership is not as big of a deal. Caleb Williams was like 80% owned in GPPs on Saturday. But guess what? He was the highest scoring quarterback. You pretty much had to have him if you wanted to win any kind of money in a GPP. Uh, Charvis Thornton, Louisiana Tech running back, was very chalky. And he didn't perform well. So if you had the right combination of playing Caleb Williams and fading Charvis Thornton, then you were sitting really pretty especially if you paired that with playing the chalk wide receivers that were Will Shepard of Vanderbilt and Smoke Harris of Louisiana Tech, then you were probably sitting really good in your DFS lineups in week zero. So anyway, that is week zero. But now, as Bill Belichick would say, we're on to week one. So we're going to turn our attention to this week one slate for Thursday night, and we're going to identify the guys that need to be in your lineups for this DFS slate. Before we do that, let's go ahead and break down what the best games to target might be for this DFS 
All right, so which games are in fact going to be the best ones to target here on this Thursday night slate? Well, that's a little bit of a tough question to ask. On DraftKings, this slate is full of games that feature FBS versus FCS teams, such as Elon versus Wake, Rhode Island versus Georgia State, St. Francis versus Western Michigan, and so on. And so those games are likely anticipated to be blowouts. And blowouts are not really good news for college football DFS. What it likely means in a blowout is that your players, if they're starters, are going to normally play for about a half or maybe three quarters. And maybe they hit value, maybe they don't. Maybe you play a quarterback in that game and he just ends up handing the ball off all game and throws for one touchdown and doesn't hit value. Or maybe you play a running back and they decide to just run his backup because the game's decided. It's not the most predictable situation to play guys from a lot of these blowouts. Now, might you find guys who are diamonds in the rough hidden gems? Absolutely. Could you play a backup wide receiver who catches two garbage time touchdowns? Yeah. Could you play a backup running back who goes for 100 yards because he gets the ball 27 times? Yeah. But it's generally harder to predict when you have those games. So which games might we want to actually target them? Well, I actually particularly like the Kent State versus UCF game for one team in this game. Um, UCF is implied 47 points in this game, and they're 37-point favorites against Kent State. Kent State was solid last year, but they just are not returning a whole lot of their talent that they had in on either side of the ball. And so Kent State's not going to be very good. UCF is going to be a team that can really fill up the scoreboard this year. And so I expect them to do that against the Golden Flashes on Thursday night. Now, in a reasonably competitive game, NC State and UConn. Um, is a decent one to look at. NC State's implied 30 points, and they're 14 point favorites against UConn. So this one's not likely to be a blowout. And it, it's also likely to be one where NC State does score quite a bit of points as well. So those are just two situations to keep in mind that I would look to target here for this 11 game slate. Now, like I said, if you want to go after the blowouts, there's plenty of guys to go after in the blowouts. Like it, it's totally a viable strategy. Just know that it carries a little bit of risk to do so. Now, let's go ahead and break down the quarterback position. So, John Reese Plumley of UCF is the top option on the board for a reason. The two point or the two sports star, yes, he actually plays baseball for the UCF Knights, is really good for fancy purposes. He's a dual threat quarterback. He runs the ball quite a lot, as you can tell by his game log. And not only that, but he was really good last year in blowouts. In games that UCF won in a blowout fashion last year, he averaged 38.15 fantasy points, you know, showing a high ceiling of a 55 fantasy point performance against Temple. That was a 70 to 13 win by UCF. So this guy really makes the UCF offense go. He really, you know, has a high ceiling because of his passing and his rushing ability. And if UCF does get to 47 points like they're implied, it's going to be likely because John Reese Plumley has multiple touchdowns, either passing or running. He is the top option at the quarterback position Thursday night. Cam Rising is the only other quarterback above $10,000 on DraftKings. He has a questionable tag, but I believe he's going to play from every indication that I have seen on the app formerly known as Twitter. Um, and so I believe that he's going to end up playing in this game. He's not in a bad spot. He had a really good season last year, averaging almost 24 fantasy points per game. But against Florida, he had one of his worst performances of the season, and it was still 20.74 fantasy points. So I don't think he's a bad play, but I don't necessarily like the price tag on Cameron Rising to get a guy at $10,300 who's going up against a team in Florida that's easily one of the three or four best defenses on this slate. If you watched my college football previews last year, you'll know that I have a saying about playing against good defenses in college football DFS. If you don't have to play a guy against a good defense, don't. There's plenty of bad defenses in college football. And so in a situation where we've got plenty of other quarterbacks to target, rising is not on my short list. However, in DFS, sometimes the guys who on paper don't make for good plays become good plays because of low ownership. I don't expect a whole lot of people to be clicking Cam Rising when they can just pay $300 more to get John Reese Plumley, or they can pay down for numerous other options. So I do think he's going to be a low-owned play, and I do think there's a little bit of upside in playing him in DFS for that reason, even though I'm not a fan of the matchup and the price tag. Jade Rashada is a super talented quarterback. He was like 
all the rave when he was in high school and he had all the controversy around the NIL deals and his recruitment. And now it's time for him to finally hit the field. And he's going to be the starting quarterback for Arizona state against Southern Utah in week one. So you got a super talented guy in a super juicy matchup. Like there's definitely worse situations, right? Like, I don't know how it's going to go, but if you're somebody who likes to bet on talent and likes to play guys with good matchups, there's Jaden Rashada right there. I would personally rather pay down slightly, though, for Braylon Braxton. And the reason why is because of this Tulsa offense. Last year, you know, Davis Brin was the primary quarterback, but Braylon Braxton down the stretch had to fill in as the starter when Davis Brin got hurt, and he was pretty good. Uh, He averaged... 22.7 22.7 fantasy points per game as the starter in this Tulsa offense. And nobody he played against was as good of a matchup as he's going to see in Arkansas Pine Bluff. So you've got a guy in a high volume passing offense who's done it before. He had two fantasy performances over 30 points last season, and he's got a really good matchup. Like, I kind of really like Braylon Braxton. If I were to have a lineup where I wasn't paying up for John Reese Plumley and I could pay up for one other quarterback, it would be Braylon Braxton, in my personal opinion. Now, Brennan Armstrong of NC State is a guy that I like quite a bit also. So he is a transfer coming over from Virginia, and he did not have a great year last year, but the 2021 season, he was really good for Virginia, put up a lot of points, put up a lot of fantasy points, which is what we like. And he's a dual threat. He has the ability to run the football as well. And so you're getting a solid matchup, as we mentioned in this game against UConn, where NC State's 14-point favorites are projected to score 30 points. And I'm kind of buying a dual-threat quarterback in that situation. He had three games last year where he had over 25 fantasy points, so we know he can have big-time performances. And last year, NC State beat UConn 41-10. Their quarterback, Devin Leary, who is not a dual-threat, he's very much a pocket passer, had 31 fantasy points without using his legs. So I really like that you can get this dual threat guy in a good matchup, in a good spot, for a reasonable price tag, $8,900 on DraftKings. Mitch Griffiths is another guy that I like a lot for Wake Forest. So Sam Hartman, in after spending two decades at Wake Forest, is now at Notre Dame. And so you've got Mitch Griffiths as you know kind of the successor to the Sam Hartman era. He got one start last season against VMI in the opener when Sam Hartman was injured. And in a similar situation to what he's going to see this week, he put up 22.62 fantasy points, threw for almost 300 yards, had three touchdowns. If he got to 300 yards, he gets that three-point bonus on DraftKings, which is valuable. So you're looking at a guy who is in a offense that has one of the fastest tempos in college football, throws the ball all over the yard, great receiving core, FCS defense across from him, and we've seen him do it before. Yeah, sign me up for some Mitch Griffiths on Thursday night. I really like the situation he's in. And if you play season-long college fantasy football or best ball college fantasy football, he's a guy that I really like for those purposes. Next up is the budget quarterbacks. So my favorite budget quarterbacks. First one is going to be Darren Granger of Georgia State. So last year, he only had one game, only one below 15 fantasy points. So he has as high a floor as any quarterback. I think he makes for a great cash game quarterback in DFS for that reason. And he's got a good matchup. He gets to play an FCS team in Rhode Island. If you look at like the worst teams that they played last year, uh, Charlotte, the 49ers, which is my school, they weren't very good. They did beat Georgia State 42 to 41, but in that game, Darren Granger had 38 fantasy points. It was his best performance of the season. Old Dominion, another bad team that they played against. They won 31 to 17, 31 fantasy points for Darren Granger. When Georgia State plays bad teams, Darren Granger tends to play well. Well, guess what? He plays an FCS team this week in Rhode Island. So I am a believer in Darren Granger. If you want to cut cost at quarterback, he's one option that you can go with. Another option that you can go with is a guy that I think is going to go a little bit under the radar, and that is Jacob Zeno of UAB. Last year, he had a few starts, two starts, it looks like, for the UAB Blazers. And in one of those, he had 32 fantasy points against Texas San Antonio. In this game, he is going to be the starter for UAB season opener against North Carolina A&T, Aggie Pride. Um, that's a really big deal if you're from Greensboro, North Carolina, like I am. So I realized that that reference probably fell flat to a lot of you guys. Anyway, Jacob Zeno gets a great matchup against an FCS team in North Carolina A&T. He's shown success as a starter before. 
I really think this is a good spot for Jacob Zeno. As, as much as, you know, a lot of people in my hometown love the NCAA and T Aggies, I don't see them, you know, upsetting UAB in this one. They might be able to hang with UAB for a little bit. They're a quality FCS opponent, but I just really like the upside of Jacob Zeno at a very affordable price tag. Now, if you are to roll the dice on any of these FCS quarterbacks, these FCS teams that are playing FBS teams, they're going to be trailing. And if they're in the game, like if they're within the possibility of coming back and winning it, they're going to try to throw the ball to get back in it. So you might get a lot of passing volume out of some of these teams. Granted, is it going to help you if the game ends up being 70 to 10 and the quarterback throws for one touchdown? No. But if you're going to get a guy who throws the ball 47 times, they end up putting three touchdowns on the board. Could that end up helping you? Yes, it actually really could. So in terms of these FCS quarterbacks, the few that catch my eye are Kasim Hill of Rhode Island going up against Georgia State, who is not a great defense. And then you have uh, Cole Doyle of St. Francis, the Red Flash, they are. Um, and he's going up against Western Michigan. Um, both these guys were successful in their FCS seasons. And those are probably two of the weaker opponents that you see out of an FCS opponent this week. So I could buy into those two having a successful week. All right. If you are still here watching, that is our list at the quarterback position. If I didn't mention a guy, then I'm probably not too interested in playing him. But I, I try to make sure I get you know a lot of the guys that you need to know the most information about. If you like what you're seeing here on this video on YouTube, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. You'll be notified when all of our weekly college football, golf, and NFL content drops. All right. Let's go ahead and switch on over now to the running back position. So the running back position I find very interesting. I did not expect when I opened up this slate to see Keyshawn King as the number one running back. Um, Keyshawn King is now a Western Michigan Bronco. He is the highest priced running back on DraftKings. He is coming over to Western Michigan from Virginia Tech, of which he appeared in a small sample size to be a very talented back, but didn't really ever kind of catch on with a feature role. What's interesting about him being the highest priced back is that the depth charts that I find on Western Michigan, and y'all, there's not a whole lot of available information on Western Michigan. The information that I have says that Zahir Abdus-Salam is the starter. Now, am I going to be checking that before game time to make sure that is the case? Yes. Am I going to be locking in either of these two into my lineups? No. I'm going to be making sure before kickoff that I, I know what this situation looks like before I play either King or Abdus Salam. If Abdus Salam does end up being the starter at only $4,300 on DraftKings, he's one of the best value plays at the slate. But Keyshawn King, he is the highest price back on the slate for a reason. He's supremely talented. He's got a good matchup against St. Francis. I, I could see him getting to value, but like I said, I really want to make sure that he's the starter in this backfield before I play him in any of my lineups at that expensive price tag on Thursday night. Now, one that also intrigues me is Sean Tyler of Minnesota. So for a long time, what feels like a really long time, Mo Ibrahim was the bell cow back in Minnesota, which didn't really give a whole lot to anybody else in the Minnesota backfield. Well, Sean Tyler is now going to be the starter for Minnesota. However, P.J. Fleck has come out and said that it's going to be a running back committee with Sean Tyler, Bryce Williams, Zach Evans, and Darius Taylor. So, do we necessarily know how this committee is going to shake out? No, no, we do not. However, do we know that Minnesota is going to run the ball a lot? Yes, yes, we do. So, if you're somebody who plays multiple lineups, I would have no problem whatsoever with playing one lineup with each of these four Minnesota running backs, Tyler, Evans, Williams, and Taylor. Tyler, if he does end up truly being the leader of that committee, has a lot of upside in an offense that loves to run the football in a matchup against Nebraska. But if he's in a committee, then I'd kind of prefer to play one of the cheaper options in that committee. Now, of the high price running backs, the one that seems the most secure is Cody Schrader. So some people would look at the, the board and say, oh, but isn't Cody Schrader in a, in a committee with Nathaniel Pete? Well, not really. Cody Schrader actually outcarried Nathaniel Pete in Missouri's last seven games. And it's also important to know when you're looking at one of these FBS versus FCS games, I love to see what they did in the other like blowouts 
of last season. And so in the games that Cody Schrader played that were lopsided last season, he had 27.7 against New Mexico and then 13.2 against Louisiana Tech. And so I kind of feel like you've got a guy who is – you know, can be successful in a situation where his team wins in a blowout. And so I think he's probably the most secure back sitting up there at seven grand. I think you're if you play him, you're going to really want to hope that he gets into the end zone because he doesn't catch a whole lot of passes. And, and so you really need that touchdown bonus if you want him to accumulate a high total. But amongst all the options at the top of the board, yes, he's for sure the most safe. Now, looking further down the board in the 6K range, I do think there are three options that are pretty safe bets to get a lot of carries. The first is Jaquindon Jackson of Utah, who is a converted quarterback who in only 36 total carries in the last three games of last year became an absolute breakout star in the college football DFS space. He was a guy that you pretty much had to have in your lineups those last few weeks if you wanted to win when Utah was playing. And so in those last three games, he had 32.7, 25.5, and 15.9 fantasy points. That's an incredible end of the season for Jack Wyndon Jackson. I expected to see him priced up higher, but I'll gladly take the price tag here at 6,500. Even though this matchup against Florida is far from enviable, I believe he is supremely talented, and I believe Utah is committed to giving him the football. Now, Jalen Houston, Jordan Houston, excuse me, of NC State is kind of in the opposite situation. So NC State's top backs from last year are gone. And so it kind of just leaves Jordan Houston there as like the incumbent starter. I don't think he's supremely talented. I don't think he is elite as a rusher. He averaged a little over four yards a carry last year, but he's had another year in the system, another year in the weight room in the off season, another year to grow up. And he is going to be the workhorse back. And so there's so few workhorse backs in college football that I'm kind of inclined to go with this guy who I know is going to get a lot of carries, even if I don't think he's as good or as efficient as some of the other running backs on the slate. Now, my favorite play on the slate at the running back position is going to be Jermaine Brown Jr. of UAB. So first off, we already mentioned he's got the matchup against FCS opponent, North Carolina A&T. If you're looking at his stats from last year and you're kind of underwhelmed, don't be. He split carries with Dwayne McBride last season, who, oh, by the way, is playing for the Minnesota Vikings right now. He was a very good college running back. And so Jermaine Brown Jr., as the second best back in the backfield last year, averaged 14.4 yards per carry, had over 25 fantasy points three different times. So he's got a lot of upside. He is the lead back in this backfield now, and he's got a great matchup. What is not to like against Jermaine Brown Jr.? Now, if you're sitting there thinking, oh, hold on, let me think of another opportunity here then you're probably onto something because Jermaine Brown Jr. was a part of a committee. So what's you know the odds of them keeping in a committee? Well, Isaiah Jacobs, I think, becomes an interesting option for that reason. And I believe Taven Curry becomes an interesting option for that reason. I don't necessarily know which of the two of them projects to be the pure second string running back, but I would expect it to be one of those two for the UAB Blazers. And so if Jermaine Brown Jr. does end up being in a committee again, then you can really have yourself a good value play by going with another one of those UAB running backs. Now, Justice Ellison for Wake Forest was a part of a one-two punch last year that involved him and Christian Turner. And Christian Turner is no longer a Wake Forest Demon Deacon. And so you're going to get Justin Ellison, Justice Ellison with likely an increased carry share against an opponent in Elon that is probably going to be overmatched. I think there's worse you could do than that. I think he's an elite cash game running back for that reason. Now, other situations that I want to talk about, Tulsa is kind of hard to figure out. There's not really a whole lot of information out there um, as to whether Watkins or Ford is going to be the starter, but we know that offense is going to put up some points. Another guy that I really like for a cash game play is RJ Harvey of UCF. This is the Gus Malzahn system at UCF now. We know he likes to run the football, and he looks to be the lead back in that system heading into this season. And then probably the lowest that I would go on the board would be Marcus Carroll of Georgia State. We already mentioned Darren Granger of Georgia State and how, you know, we expect this Georgia State offense to put up some points. Well, why not go with Marcus Carroll, a guy who showed an upside of 
37.6 fantasy points in a blowout win against Southern Miss last season. So I, I really like the chances of if Georgia State wins this one in a blowout, Marcus Carroll is probably going to end up, you know, having a lot of fantasy points. When you're if you're building multiple lineups this week and you're looking at all these FBS versus FCS games, I would have no problem like pairing up teams and like saying, okay, in this lineup, I'm gonna play the passing game of Georgia State and the run game of Wake. And then in this one, I'm going to play the passing game of Wake and the run game of Georgia State. You know, just as an example, I would have had no problem if you constructed lineups that way. But, you know, these FBS teams that are playing FCS competition, they're going to put up some points one way or the other. And so that is definitely an option for building your lineups here this Thursday night. All right, so if you have gotten here, and you're wondering, well, you know, here's all these good players that Mike's naming. Who is he actually going to play? So there is ways that you can find me to get more information out of me. First is follow me on Twitter at Mike's Money Picks. I'll gladly answer any DMs. Um, I post the college football rundown for every slate. If there is breaking injury news that impacts how I feel about a slate, I usually tweet about it. I also discuss in the Fantasy Corner Discord. There's a lot of very good, very smart DFS players in there. Link is in the description on YouTube. We've got a college football channel that we talk pretty much about every slate in there and talk about all of our favorite plays. And then also, I was told a while back, never write for free. Um, and so I do write an article um, that is pretty long form about ownership, about my favorite plays, about how to construct a lineup for each slate. And I post it to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. I would consider those my official plays, my core plays for the week if you are interested in all right, so that does it for the running back position. Let's go ahead and wrap this thing up by talking about some wide receivers. All right, so I did find the wide receiver salaries this week to be really interesting the way DraftKings set it up for this Thursday slate. You've got two UCF wide receivers in the top three in Javon Baker and Kobe Hudson. What DraftKings is basically saying is we're not going to let you stack John Reese Plumley and both the top two UCF receivers in the same lineup, just kind of boxing you out by cost. It would really handicap the rest of your lineup if you tried to fit in both these wide receivers. However, when it comes to stacking in college football, when you've got a dual threat quarterback like a John Reese Plumley, you really don't need to stack them with two wide receivers. Sometimes you can get away with stacking with one, or if they end up putting a lot of fantasy points up on the ground, you can end up getting away with stacking your quarterback with no wide receivers. In the case of UCF, I think one would be the optimal number. But looking at the profiles, I would much prefer Kobe Hudson to Javon Baker. And he's actually $300 cheaper on DraftKings, which I like. He is more expensive on FanDuel, however. Near the end of last season, Hudson was pretty much outperforming uh, Baker on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, he was seeing more targets. He was seeing more receptions, more yards, and he was more likely to find the end zone. He had bigger games as well. Hudson is an Auburn transfer that took a while to get going. He did not play until week six, but once he got going, he really hit the ground running. I think he's a little bit more talented. He's got experience in Gus Malzahn's system, and, and I think if you're going to get some big explosive plays out of the UCF pass game, it's probably going to be with Kobe Hudson. I would not mind going with UCF's third receiver damage as well. I think that Baker and Hudson are going to see a lot of ownership. And so if you want to try to make an ownership pivot play, I don't think damage is a bad move. Um, UCF does run pretty much exclusively three wide receiver sets. So you could do much worse than Corey Gamage. Now, Elijah Badger is on my do not playlist for this slate. Um, he has suspended the first half of the game for targeting. Um, and so I'm kind of good on playing a guy who's not going to play half of football in a game that's an FBS versus an FCS opponent. Now, what that does for us, though, is that's going to open up some opportunities for these other Arizona State wide receivers. First up is Xavier Guillory, who is starting on the outside as well. Um, he is a transfer into Arizona State. And then after that, Sanders is listed as the other starter, Giovanni Sanders, um, who had a um, pretty big end to the season last year against Arizona. And then the other listed starter would be um, Omir uh, Tyson. No, I'm sorry, Troy Omir. My bad on that one. Um, he is the backup behind Elijah Badger, so he would be the most direct beneficiary of Elijah Badger's role, um, and he might be a low-priced guy that you can get into your lineups. They also use tight end J1 Conyers quite a bit, and J1 Conyers did have some big games near the end of last season, so I wouldn't mind going to him as well. Basically, the rest of this Arizona State receiving court, not named Elijah Badger um, or 
Jordan Tyson is going to see a, a, an increased workload and going to see plenty of opportunity this Thursday night. I don't mind playing any of them in a lineup, especially if you're stacking it with Jaden Rashada. After Arizona State, Luther Burden of Missouri is a guy that I'm going to be playing a lot of as well. He was a former five-star recruit. I think he's just really talented. He's got a little bit of, I think my, my comparison would be Debo Samuel in him, where they look to get him the ball in very specific ways. They'll get him the ball on screens, on jet sweeps, um, you know, kind of these short throws, dumpy throws, like that they're just going to try to get him the ball in space and let him see if he can make a guy miss and, and you know, or break some tackles and end up getting a big gain or getting a touchdown. But he's going to see the ball in his hands a lot, and he's going to be the most talented player on the field. And so I like that as a combination at a very reasonable price tag. Even if I'm not stacking with a quarterback, Luther Burden's a guy that I'm probably going to be playing in my lineups quite a bit. Wake Forest is another team that we got to talk about the wide receiver position at. So A.T. Perry, preseason superstar of the New Orleans Saints, is gone from Wake Forest. And he vacates a lot of targets into this offense. Their three starting receivers heading into this year are going to be Jamal Banks, who had a breakthrough year last year, Taylor Morin, who's going to be operating out of the slot, and Keyshawn Williams as well. Keyshawn Williams would probably be the most direct comparison to A.T. Perry, in my opinion, but Banks is really explosive as a playmaker deep down the field. Banks is also probably um, the most productive of these guys last year. And then you got Taylor Moore and operating out of the slot. I would kind of have a little bit of an affinity for Taylor Morin with a guy like um, Mitch Griffiths being the quarterback with I don't think he's necessarily going to push the ball downfield as much as Sam Hartman did. And Taylor Morin last year in the game that Mitch Griffiths did start against BMI had five receptions for 74 yards and a touchdown, 18.4 total fantasy points out of that. So I like all these wake wide receivers, especially if I'm playing Mitch Griffiths. But if I'm playing one of them, I think Morin might be my guy. Um, I really, it's not to say that I don't like Banks or Williams or that I'm not going to be playing Banks or Williams because I am going to be, but I think that Morin might be my guy. He, I think he might vibe with Mitch Griffiths' play style a little bit better than the other two. NC State is another team that we got to talk about their wide receiver room. So they're vacating a lot of targets from last year's team. Thayer Thomas, uh, their leading receiver, as well as a few others are gone. But they're priced very strange on DraftKings. First off, you've got Julian Gray and Terrell Timmons Jr., um, who are listed as co-starters on the depth chart. I get why Timmons is priced up the highest. He's a super talented player. He's actually a guy that I coached against because I coach high school football in the Piedmont Triad area. He's supremely talented. He's very difficult to guard. But I don't like the fact that he's listed as a co-starter. Like, why would I want to play a wide receiver that's the most expensive guy on their team when he's might not be playing 100% of the snaps. So I'm kind of out on him for that reason. Um, the other two listed starters are Keon Lazane and Porter Rooks. And I kind of don't really know what to expect out of this NC State receiving core. So this is another situation where if you are playing multiple lineups, playing all of the NC State wide receivers separately might be the move because I think one of them has the potential to go off, but I don't know which one especially if you're going to stack with Brandon Armstrong, who is a mobile quarterback, but who also, you know, can put up some passing point or fantasy points through the air. I think that one of these guys is going to have himself a really good day, but I just don't really feel confident in knowing which one it's going to be. You know, might it end up being Gray, who's listed as the co-starter and is the cheapest on DraftKings? I don't know. Might it be Porter Rooks? Might it be Keon Lazine? Might it be Terrell Timmons? I don't have a for sure answer to that. I find it is a very difficult situation to project, but I do think that it's between those four guys for this week one Thursday night game. Now, the other two offenses that I'm really interested in at the wide receiver position are Georgia State as well as Tulsa. Georgia State doesn't have a wide receiver above $4,000. They're vacating a lot of targets from last year's team, like Jamari Thrash going in Louisville. But one of these guys has to catch the football, right? And if you're playing Darren Granger, you're going to want to pair him with one of his wide receivers. DraftKings did get the pricing pretty much correct. The top four wide receivers are listed as the top four on the depth chart. Um, and so I think this is another one where, you know, unless there's something that comes out from a beat writer or some sort of new information that comes out, I don't know which one to pick, but I do know that one of them is going to turn into the favorite target of Darren Granger. And then the other team that I want to talk about is Tulsa. So Tulsa's uh, highest price wide receiver is $4,700. 
Uh, Malachi Jones is that guy, and he was the only one that kind of had a little bit of a role last year that is still with this team. Um, Juan Carlos Santana and Keelan Stokes are both gone, um, and so you know, kind of you got their third option last year, Malachi Jones, possibly stepping into being the first option there this year. Now, other than that, from the wide receiver position, y'all, um, it, for all the guys I didn't talk about, stacking, stacking, stacking. If you're playing, you know, the Utah quarterback, play yourself a Utah wide receiver. If you're playing the St. Francis quarterback, play a St. Francis wide receiver. In college football, you can afford to play a lineup where two of your three wide receivers or even three of your three wide receivers are stacked with your quarterback. Um, and so I think that that's probably going to be the best option if you're looking for any other specific wide receiver targets. I do not think that this is like last Saturday slate for week zero, where there were multiple guys that were $3,000 that were listed as starters for some of those teams who ended up coming through with big time performances. I believe there were two of them on Hawaii that did that. And so I think it's a little bit harder to find for this slate than it was for the week zero slate. So maybe DraftKings did a little bit better job of, of constructing their salaries for this Thursday night slate. All right, that does it for the week one. Thursday night college football DFS preview. Hopefully you guys like what you saw. If you're on YouTube, please hit the like button. It shows me a lot of support and I really do appreciate it. And also hit the subscribe button. You'll be notified when new episodes drop. Also, if you want more of me, you got Twitter, you got the Fancy Corner Discord, and you got the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. Hopefully I will be able to see you guys for the Saturday slate. If not, best of luck to you this Thursday night. Best of luck to you in all your college football DFS endeavors. Hopefully I was able to give you guys some information on this one that will help you guys win some money this week. Thank you guys for watching or listening, and I will see you next time.